This is a recording of Journeys in Literature, American Traditions, page 229. Realism, Regionalism, Naturalism. The passage is entitled, The Return of a Private. Sunday comes in a western wheat harvest with such sweet and sudden relaxation to man and beast that it would be holy for that reason, if for no other, and Sundays are usually fair in harvest time. As one goes out into the field in the hot morning sunshine, with no sound abroad save the crickets, and the indescribably pleasant silken rustling of the ripened grain, the reaper and the very sheaves in the stubble seem to be resting dreaming. Around the house, in the shade of the trees, the men sit, smoking, dozing, or reading the papers, while the women, never resting, moving about at the housework. The men eat on Sundays, about the same as on other days, and breakfast is no sooner over and out of the way than dinner begins. But at the Smith farm, there were no men dozing or reading. Mrs. Smith was alone with her three children, Mary, nine, Tommy, six, and little Ted, just past four. Her farm, rented to a neighbor, lay at the head of a coulee or narrow galley, made at some far-off post-glacial period by the vast and angry floods of water which gullied these tremendous furrows in the level prairie. Furrows, so, page 230. Deep, that undisturbed portions of the original level rose like hills on either side, rose to quite considerable mountains. The chickens wakened her as usual that Sabbath morning from dreams of her absent husband, from whom she had not heard for weeks. The shadows drifted over the hills, down the slopes, across the wheat, and up the opposite wall in a leisurely way, as if being Sunday, they could take it easy also. The fowls clustered about the housewife as she went out into the yard. Fuzzy little chickens swarmed out of the coops where their clucking and perpetually disgruntled mothers tramped about, petulantly thrusting their heads through the spaces between the slats. A cow called in a deep musical bass, and a calf answered from a little pen nearby and a pig scurried guiltily out of the cabbages. Seeing all this, seeing the pig in the cabbages, the tangle of grass in the garden, the broken fence which she had mended again and again, the little woman, hardly more than a girl, sat down and cried. The bright Sabbath morning was only a mockery without him. A few years ago they had bought this farm, paying part, mortgaging the rest in the usual way. Edward Smith was a man of terrible energy. He worked nights and Sundays, as the saying goes, to clear the farm of its brush and of its insatiate mortgage. In the midst of his Herculean struggle came the call for volunteers and with the grim and unselfish devotion to his country, which made the Eagle Brigade able to whip its weight in wildcats, he threw down his sigh and a grub axe, turned his cattle loose, and became a blue-coated cog in a vast machine for killing men, and not thistles. While the millionaire sent his money to England for safekeeping, this man, with his girl wife and three babies, left them, page 231, on a mortgaged farm and went away to fight for an idea. It was foolish, but it was sublime for all that. It was three years before, and the young wife, sitting on the well curb on this bright Sabbath harvest morning, was righteously rebellious. It seemed to her that she had borne her share of the country's sorrow. Two brothers had been killed. The renter in whose hands her husband had left, the farm had proven a villain. One year the farm had been without crops, and now the overripe grain was waiting the tardy hand of the neighbor who had rented it and who was cutting his own grain first. About six weeks before, she had received a letter saying, We'll be discharged in a little while, but no other word had come from him. 
She had seen by the papers that his army was being discharged, and from day to day other soldiers slowly percolated in blue streams back into the state and county. But still her hero did not return. Each week she told the children that he was coming, and she had watched the road so long that it had become unconscious, and as she stood at the well or by the kitchen door, her eyes were fixed unthinkingly on the road that wound down the coulee. Nothing wears on the human soul like waiting. If the stranded mariner, searching the sun-bright seas, could once give up hope of a ship, that horrible grinding on his brain would seize. It was this waiting, hoping on the edge of despair that gave Emma Smith no rest. Neighbors said with kind intentions, he's sick, maybe in, and can't start north just yet. He'll come along one of these days. Why don't he write, was her answer, her question, which silenced them all. This Sunday morning, it seemed to her as if she could not stand it any longer. The house seemed intolerably lonely. So she dressed the little ones in their best calico dresses and homemade jackets and closing up the house, set off down the coulee to Old Mother Gray's. Old Widder Gray lived at the mouth of the coulee. She was a widow woman with a large family of stalwart boys and laughing page 232, girls. She was the visible incarnation of hospitality and optimistic poverty. With Western op open-heartedness, she fed every mouth that asked food of her and worked herself to death as cheerfully as her girls danced in the neighborhood harvest dances. She waddled down the path to meet Mrs. Smith with a broad smile on her face. Oh, you little dears. Come right to your granny. Give me a kiss. Come right in, Miss Smith. How are you, anyway? Nice morning, ain't it? Come in and sit down. Everything's in a clutter, but that won't scare you away. She led the way into the best room, a sunny square room, carpeted with a faded and patched rug carpet, a, and papered with a horrible white and green striped wallpaper where a few faded effigies of dead members of the family hung in various sized oval walnut frames. The house resounded with singing, laughter, whistling, trampling of heavy boots, and scuffing. Half-grown boys came to the door and crooked their fingers at the children who ran out and were soon heard in the midst of the fun. Don't suppose you've heard from Ed? Mrs. Smith shook her head. He'll turn up some day when you ain't looking for him. The good old soul had said that so many times that poor Mrs. Smith derived no comfort from it any longer. Liz heard from Al the other day. He's coming some day this week. Anyhow, they expect him. Did he say anything of? No, he didn't, Mrs. Gray admitted. But then it was only a short letter anyhow. Al ain't much for writing anyway, anyhow. But come out and see my new cheese. I tell you, I don't believe I ever had better luck in my life. If Ed should come, I want you should take him up a piece of this cheese. It was beyond human nature to resist the influence of that noisy, hearty, loving household. And in the midst of the singing and laughing, the wife forgot her anxiety, for the time at least, and laughed and sang with the rest.